I really like the story of Jacob wrestling with God in our first lesson today. Jacob is not always a likable guy, not usually the one we pull for in these stories. I think we all may have cringed a few weeks ago when we heard the story of Jacob cheating his brother Esau out of his birthright for a bowl of red lentils. Also, Jacob acts despicably when he tricks his father Isaac into giving him his blessing instead of blessing Esau. We see in Jacob an opportunist, maybe the worst form of capitalist, who gains from others' need, even the needs of his family. But there are things I like about Jacob, and one of them is that his same opportunistic personality extends even to his spirituality. God, or one of God's messengers, the story is quite ambiguous about which it is, passes within reach of Jacob, and Jacob seizes the opportunity, grabs hold of the being, and hangs on for dear life, struggling all night, we're told, crying out for a blessing, and even when the being puts his hip out of joint, he will not give up, and he requires of the being the being's blessing. And we're told that Jacob, while struggling with God and with humans, prevails. We're not really sure what this means. Maybe Jacob is wrestling with his own guilt because of the way he has treated his father and brother. We do know that Jacob changes his life after this point. No longer does he try to capitalize on his brother's misfortune. In fact, he gives Esau huge wealth in goats, flocks, and camels. And when they are reunited, Esau doesn't seek revenge, but he is reconciled with his brother. Jacob, in struggling with God and searching his soul, becomes Israel. And from him, tradition and scripture tell us that the 12 tribes of Israel descend and continue to bless us with their witness in struggling with God. My grandfather, whom we called Papa, used to be a passionate gardener. He had a three-acre garden in a river bottom about half a mile from his house. And each evening in the summer, he would commute on his tractor there. I would go down to the garden with him, and while he was on the tractor plowing or cultivating, I would walk around the field and try to identify the footprints of the non-human visitors to the garden. I would see the telltale markings in the sandy soil of box turtles that would visit the tomato row and take with them a juicy bite of the red gloves as a souvenir of their visit. In the early spring, I would see small corn seedlings pulled up and sitting on the top of the ground thanks to the visit by the crows. Periodically, I would be startled by the legless visitors slithering through the green beans. I hate snakes. <laughs> Most of these visitors and their gleaning of Papa's field would go unnoticed. But there was one set of footprints in the sand that always caused much distress when discovered and that was the deer. On quite a few occasions, expletives were followed by, those deer have been in my garden again. And then the plotting and the consulting would start. Papa's golf games would become more like war strategy meetings than serious golf. One golf buddy suggested going to the zoo and getting tiger dung to lace the garden with it. The smell of the traces of this great predator, he reasoned, would keep the deer away. South Carolina deer have never encountered tigers. <laughs> and not having ever seen or smelled tiger dung, they just stepped over it on the way to the produce in the garden. <laughs> Put up a scarecrow, another garden warrior suggested. The deer were no more afraid of Papa's old clothes than they were of the ones they usually saw him in. So back to war strategizing on the green. Hang up pie plates, those silver round plates on strings, and that will keep all the crows and the deer out. This trick may have worked, but we were unable to try it because it was vetoed by my grandmother who said it was too tacky. And so the battle continued. 
Each year when the cost of gardening was tallied, when the heat of the season was factored in and when the frustration of the deer was considered, the question would always arise, is all that struggle worth it? You could buy everything he grew in the store. You could get it any time of year. Why bother with the garden, Papa? Golf is much cleaner, more fun, no weeds, and no deer. But on those deep, dark, gray days of winter, Papa would go down to the basement and he would shuffle through the freezer and grab a few jars off the shelf and he would ascend into the kitchen, kitchen bearing the gifts of summer. He would start cooking corn, tomatoes, okra, and those dark, bland days of January would smell of June and July. Now there was never an audible decision to have a garden the following spring, but soon seed catalogs would arrive in the mail and the seeds would somehow always get ordered. In our gospel reading today, we find another feeding miracle, one that was apparently so important to the early church that this miracle alone was recorded in all four gospels. That's biblical shorthand for pay attention. Here we find disciples wondering audibly, Jesus, is it worth all this struggle? Our means are meager, Jesus. You didn't prepare us for this. We're fishermen. With enough notice, we could have caught enough to have had this event catered. And we're not here to feed people. It's not part of our job description. After all, we can't be all things to all people. But Jesus doesn't let them get away. He holds them in place in their mental struggling. He allows them to take stock of the situation and then he demands them, bring me what you have. Jesus, it's just so meager, it's not worth mentioning. Only five loaves and two fish, it would take a ton of fish to feed this crowd. And Jesus says, bring me what you have. Jesus takes that simple meal, blesses it and gives it, and 5,000 men plus women and children are fed in the wilderness. We often get hung up on the food metaphor here, I think. If there is any time that Episcopalians become biblical literalists, I think it is in this story. You can laugh. <laughs> but I think it's important to see past the food here. This is not a heavenly directive to end world hunger. The people that day were not homeless. They were not normally at the soup kitchen. They just needed supper. Apparently, the disciples thought they all had the means with which to feed themselves because the disciples were going to send them into the city to buy food. This story is not about ending hunger, building soup kitchens, or dealing with the problem of homelessness. As noble as those are, this story is about feasts in unlikely places. It's about offering our inadequacies to God and allowing the blessing of God to multiply our meager offerings for the benefit of the world. Food and even money may in fact be included in our meager offerings, but it is not the sum total of what Jesus asked us to share. He says, bring what you have. So we're asked today to bring to God what we have, and we're invited to do so by Jesus who feeds us through his own brokenness. I wonder what it is that we have to offer. What brokenness are we withholding? What vulnerabilities are we hiding? What inadequacies are we unwilling to admit? Our gospel lesson is calling us to struggle with these questions, to search out meager offerings, and to give those to God, and through them God will bless our community and the world. Amen.